this, this is the moment we, as best we can say, is, is we ask that you would give us a desire for you more than anything else this world has to offer. That you would set our affections, our love upon our first love, Jesus himself. Well, Spirit, we invite you to take what we're going to talk about today and move it from our head, from information, down to revelation to our heart. You would transform us from the inside out. So, Lord, today, give us eyes to see what you're doing. Lord, give us ears to hear what you're saying. And, Lord, I pray you would just give us a heart to say yes, to obey you, to walk the way of Jesus, where you walk us into abundant life. We praise you, for you alone are king. You are worthy of all praise and honor and fame. And we all said together, amen, 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 amen. Mm. Mm -mm. I love that. I love that. That's our hope today that we believe that God is moving, that he's moving in all of our lives, that he's moving in this room. And so my heart and what Jason and I oftentimes talk about as we get the, the honor of leading is that we want to just move with what, what God is doing. And we just want to step into that stream where God is flowing. And so today, my prayer is that you would experience the living God, that there would be hope in that, that there would be uh, healing in that, and that you would leave today um, encouraged and stirred up in your faith. And so if you're a guest, man, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, tonight, at church, there's incredible, one of our most incredible things that we do here that I think, at least, is, um, are you trying to get me to sing back there? I love that note right there. Uh, no, tonight is 6 p.m. tonight. We're going to gather together and we're going to position ourselves and posture ourselves with humility. And we're going to sing to God. We're going to praise him. We're going to worship him in song. And we're going to pray. We're going to take communion together. And so I want to invite you at 6 p.m. tonight, our encounter night service. One of the things that I love that we do here, and I'm praying that God would speak to me tonight, that he would stir up some faith in me, that he would form me, conform me into his image tonight. And so, man, don't miss it. 6 p.m. tonight, we'll be here. We're going to be in uh, Psalm 23. If you, if you have your Bible, go ahead and grab out your Bible, grab your phone app, whatever you have on your Bible app, and turn to Psalm 23. We're going to be there in just a moment. We, we've been navigating and talking about in this series in a box that sometimes that we place God and our understanding of God in a box. Not that we can really place this God that is all places, all knowing, all powerful in a box, but the way we view him, the way that we believe about him, the things that we understand about him, we can place them in our own box and, uh, and it limits really how we relate to God, how we interact with him. And I was sitting at dinner a few months ago talking to a friend about this concept about a box before we actually started this series. And he said something that really stuck with me. He said, you know what, Derek, uh, there are times when Jesus will actually enter into the box that we've placed him in. But the purpose of Jesus entering into that box is to always lead us out of that box. So Jesus enters the box with the purpose of blowing up our box. That's just who he is. And I'm praying that will happen today because what we're going to talk about today, it may be just a little challenging for us to sometimes encounter God in this way or to view him in this way. Today, I want to talk about how God not only enters our box, but he also enters into our darkness. The places of in times in our life where we feel like maybe God doesn't want to do with us, maybe he doesn't want to be with us, or maybe we feel like he's distant, he's not there. And so today, I want to talk about how God enters into our darkness and provides healing from the inside out. That's where I want to go today. And it's relevant to every one of us because the reality is most of us in this room, we've gone through a dark season of life. Like we've gone and navigated troubles and, and issues and things have come against us. And, and if you haven't done that yet, maybe today you're like, man, I'm in that season right now. I feel like, man, I'm in the wilderness. Or if you haven't experienced any of those, the reality is that all of us are going to have dark seasons of life in the future. All of us are. That's why Jesus said some profound things. One of the profound things he said is, guys, I didn't come that you can just be all millionaires and never have any issues and struggles. He actually said, he said, listen, in, in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have hard times. People are going to come against you. Things are not going to go your way. But he said, in the midst of that, take heart. For what? I, I've already what? Overcome the world, right? It's a beautiful place. So we're going to be in Psalm 23 today. If, if you have your Bible, I want you to follow along. And 
We're going to see what it looks like for God to enter into our dark. Maybe the places that we feel like God doesn't want to be in, we're going to see that he actually wants to be right there in the midst of the places that we feel so down and out and hopeless. So we're going to read Psalm 23, a well-known psalm that David wrote. He says this. He says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell and the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord this morning. And so I, I want to break this down. I, I want to look at this. Now, the way the psalmist starts this out is absolutely beautiful. He talks about God being our shepherd, and, and he starts out on this really, really great note of saying, Listen, God takes us to, to these green pastures, which is beautiful. Like, like when it's not raining, just think about that. All that rain is going to lead us to green pastures. Amen? No mud. It's going to be, it's going to be glorious. So he says he, he leads us to lay down in green pastures, and he he, he, he takes us and puts us behind, beside still waters, not water that's overflowing out of the banks of the river, but, but still waters. He, he's really given us a picture of this beautiful thing that God desires for every single person in this room, that he wants to provide for us, that he wants to give us comfort, that he wants to give us the desires of our heart. This is the heart of God for you. It really almost pictures a, a utopia. This is what we see David start out, and we all can get behind that. Man, God is definitely in that, no question. When things are going good, if God is good and every good gift comes from God, God is in those moments when everything is great. And David would say the same thing. Yeah, man, God is in those moments where the pasture is green and where the still water is there. But then he shifts and he gets to verse four, and he really wrecks the box that we oftentimes put God in. Verse four, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The first thing I want you to write in your notes this morning is that God isn't absent, absent in the dark. God is not absent in the dark. And if you're like me and if you've been to a church before, or part of a church, you, you know that we love to pretend that everything is great. Man, we are so good at putting a smile on our face and somebody asks us how we're doing. Man, it couldn't be better, said the liar. Which all of us have been there and done that, right? Me included, right? And so I think sometimes we, we put God in this box to say, man, when everything's going well in my life, when I got that bonus, when I got that promotion, when everything's good with my health, that man, God is all over my life. I feel the momentum of God. He's on a move. And I believe that's true. God is moving. But what about when we feel like we're distant from God? When we feel like, man, we've just messed up one too many times and our head is down to the ground and we can't even look up to him. What about when we get that health report that we never wanted to get? What about when our marriage is headed for divorce? What about if our child is running far from the Lord and making decisions that we would never want? Where is God in that? See, and this morning where I want to go is I believe that, that God is just in, as present in those times where we feel like he's distant than he is when we're giving him high fives on the mountaintop. That he's just as present because what we see of God is he's not just a God of the mountaintop, he's also a God of the valley, that he's in the midst of of our darkest moments of life. He is there revealing himself. And so he is just as good, just as close, just as loving when we feel like we don't deserve it and the as we are, as he is in the times that we feel like we do deserve it, as if there is such a thing, right? So today I, I want to talk about the valley of the shadow of death. Now, when David writes this, he was writing from experience because in the countryside, when he's leading his flocks of sheep around, there would have been deep valleys that would have been a little kind of like a, a bad horror movie, right? Like you got these trees around, and you got the darkness, and you got things making noises, and you're like, what was that? And it was just a tree, it was just a rabbit. No, you know, maybe it was something worse. And so he was used to leading his sheep through these dark valleys. And so when we talk about the valley of the shadow of death, we're talking about hard seasons of life. When, when people have wronged you, when things haven't gone your way, when you feel like God hasn't showed up, when you feel like you've got some loss, when you feel like there's no hope, 
It's in those moments that I want to show you today that God is actually more present than we could ever imagine. And so before we launch into how do we navigate this darkness, I just want to put before you that, that today I'm not going to try to preach from a trite way of saying, hey, you know, hey, get together, believe in Jesus, everything's good, right? That's, that's just not biblical. And so today my hope is to, to give you some truth that we can all apply, but the, here's the reality. There's no equation when it comes to this kind of thing, right? If you ever hear me saying, hey, it's this easy, just do these three things and everything's good in your life, you can have a conversation with me later and really call me out to say, Derek, that's just not true. Because here's the reality. You are not a cookie cutter person. The things that you're experiencing in your life, nobody else is experiencing the exact same thing. And so why would we think that everybody can navigate the darkness the same way? But there are some things that I think I want to show you today that can help us navigate the dark. And the first thing that I want to put before you is if we're going to navigate the dark, we have to be honest in our confession to God. So confession is a fancy religious word that maybe you've heard in different churches. Confession is, is just the simplicity of this, telling the truth. So when somebody comes forward and confesses of a crime, what are they doing? They're telling the truth. It could be a good confession or a negative confession, a, a, a bad confession, but confession is just telling the truth to God. And what are we telling God when we're navigating the, the hard times of life? What we're telling him is what we perceive to be true, what we're feeling. We tell him with our words what that is. And you know why we're able to do that? Because of this. God is not insecure. Some of you need to hear that this morning. God is not insecure. He can handle your honesty. I want you to look at this because I want everybody to see this because this is really, really foundational for how we navigate the darkness. God is not insecure. He's not caught off guard. He's not surprised when you come to him and you say, God, I feel like fill in the blank. The God who knows every hair in your head, the God who knows every thought in your mind is not surprised when you express your true feelings and thoughts to him. He's not insecure. He can handle your honesty. But if you're like me, sometimes what we do is we sanitize and, and scrub up our prayers when we come to God. Like he needs us to somehow make them more palatable to him. Like we say, God, everything's great. And you know what God says? Liar. It's not great, Derek. That pain you're feeling, I feel that same thing. That loss you're feeling, I know what that's like. That's not good. Don't call what is evil good. Don't do that. Be honest with me. Tell me the truth about what you're experiencing, what you're sensing. And this is what we see in much of the Psalms. Actually, much of the Psalms, a third of the Psalms, is actually what we call a lament. It's voicing our complaint to God. It's not just rah, rah, God is everywhere, great, yay, I'm in church. No, it's, it's actually voicing real truth, honest feelings. Let me just read you a couple Psalms that we see that David and the other psalmist write. Psalm 142, this is what David writes. He says, with my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint. What's he pour out? His complaint. This is confession. Before him, I will tell my trouble before him. What's that saying? Telling God the truth is what David is doing. And this is really going to blow your minds here. This is going to open up our box to how we pray. This is Psalm 44, 23 through 26. He's speaking to God here. So this is his prayer. So I don't know if your prayers look like this, but listen to this prayer to God. Awake. He's telling God to wake up. Does God sleep, by the way? No, but he's feeling like he is, right? He's voicing what he perceives to be true. He says, awake. Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our afflictions and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust and our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us from the sake of your steadfast love. How many of you have ever prayed that way? See, that's not a very sanitized prayer. That's not going to fit in your Bible, you know, Bible school lesson. That's probably not going to preach real well over in the kids you know, today. But this is what we read in the scriptures of these men who knew God and loved him as they were open and honest with God. And this is why we see that is God desires not only our praise but our pain. And this is transformational for some of us to hear this morning that God doesn't want just your peppy praise songs. He wants those for sure. But if those peppy praise songs aren't off the truth, I'm going to tell you he'd rather hear your pain than your praise. So God, what he wants from you this morning as you're navigating this, this valley of the shadow of death, this dark season of life, he wants to know what you're really experiencing, what you're feeling on the inside. He longs to hear this. He wants both your praise and your pain. And we see this throughout the scriptures. We 
We see this even in the life of Jesus, right? Jesus gets toward the end of his life, and, and he's there in the garden. He's praying, and he says, Father, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, any way that I don't have to go through what I'm going to go through, that would be my desire. But then he says, nevertheless, which is so critical, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You know what he was doing? He's lamenting in that moment. We got a whole book in the Bible about lamentations. It's laments. It's voicing complaint to God, but finding our trust in God. That's what a lament is. It's complaining, but finding our trust. And so what was Jesus doing? He was pouring out what was true, and yet he was trusting God. Not my will, but your will be done. See, God meets us in our praise, but he also meets us in our pain. And we got to open up our box to understand that this morning. But here's what I also want you to write down is that God meets us in truth, not in empty optimism. Now, this is really hard for me because by nature, I'm an optimistic person. Like if, if it's raining outside, I'm like, let's go. The sun's going to come out, right? My wife calls me rose-colored glasses. I call her negative Nancy sometimes. And so you can relate a little bit, but I'm always positive. And this is my struggle because sometimes I'll look for the good only and I won't actually see the bad. But what God says is, I don't want you to fake it till you make it. I don't want you to come here with a smile. What I want is your truth. I want to know what you're dealing with. I want, you to, I want to hear what you're really going on inside. I don't want your empty optimism. Now, here is why that is true. And this is critical for us to understand this morning. And this is really foundational to our understanding of God. That not everything that happens to you is good. Some of you need to hear this. Not everything that happens in your life is from God and is of God. You say, Derek, how can you say that? Well, I've read the end of the book. And in the book, what's he say? He says he's going to wipe away every tear. There's going to be no more sickness. There's going to be no more divorce. There's not going to be any more animosity. And, and in that, he's actually going to right every wrong. And you know what that means if he's going to right every wrong? That means that currently some things are wrong on this planet. And there's going to be a day that he actually rights every wrong. And so you know what that means for you? Of that thing that happens to you, that you're feeling that really hurt, God feels that hurt too. When you feel that pain of loss of a loved one, God knows exactly what you're going through. He never asks us to call what is evil good, never. And so this morning, if you're going through a hard season, listen, it's okay to say you're hurt and you're going through a hard season. God is not insecure. And he invites us to be honest with him. He's so much bigger than we imagine. He's so much bigger than we imagine. The second thing, after we're honest with God and our confession of truth, what we believe to be true, the second thing that we're called to do, I see in the scripture, is that we then ask God what he wants us to know about the situation. I don't know about you, but I'm so good at... Um, Telling God what I know. Anybody else good at that? Like, I, I mean, I know. I know who's bad. I know who's sinful. I, I know who has hurt me. Um, and when I, I get done puking all over that, that thing, I, sometimes I fail to ask God, God, this is, what I've, this is my confession. He's all right with that. But then to ask him, God, what is actually true in this situation? What are you doing in the midst of this really hard time in my life, this dark season. This is where we have to go if we're going to be able to navigate this season. And, and as I was thinking about this, the reason why we need to know what God wants us to know is that in the dark, we need God's perspective more than ever. When we're navigating a season of darkness, the, the valley of the shadow of death, it's in those seasons where we can't see around us, where we're disoriented, that we need to know what God says and what he wants us to know. And it's, it's like, you know, men, just think about this. You know, you're, you're fast asleep in bed and you get an elbow to the rib, you know, and your wife, you know, she's like, hey, you gave me that rib, I'm going to wake you up. And she's like, I heard something. And what do we do? No, no, it's, it's nothing, babe. It's okay. Just go back to sleep. I'm here. It's okay. I got a gun in this closet because I'm in Northeast Tennessee. It's okay. <laughs> and then she elbows you again. She said, no, 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 I heard something. And then what do you do? Man, you get out of the bed, you, uh, stretch a little bit, you, your eyes are all messed up. If you wear contacts like me, you can't see anything, so you're kind of feeling your way through the hallway, disoriented, the lights are off, you make your way in, into the living room, and you, you're like, Where, what in the world? You're trying to look out the windows, but the blinds are shut, and so it's all dark, and then you take a step, and you're like, oh my goodness, that was a Lego. <laughs> every time, every time, I don't care what it is, it's like a mousetrap for dads, it's like, boom, ah! Why? 
Why? That's a good question. These girls thought that was funny. Why? Why? Because in that moment, we're disoriented. We can't see what is around us. We can't see what's there. We can't see that corner of that coffee table that wants to hit us right in the shin. We can't see it. And so in those moments, when we're navigating the darkness where we can't see what's around us, we can't see what's around the corner, we need somebody who can. We need God's perspective more than ever when we're in a season of darkness. That's why we ask God, what do you want me to know? What is true in this situation? And so we ask God the truth. What are you doing? What do you want me to to know? What does it look like, God, to follow you in the midst of this? And this is what David writes so beautifully. In in verse 4, he says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And then he says something interesting. He says, Your rod... And your staff, they what? They comfort me. Now, we don't have a bunch of shepherds rolling around the hills of northeast Tennessee, but but here is what David is speaking to. He's saying that a shepherd had two primary pieces of equipment, right? The first one was a rod, and that rod was meant to keep away and to fight back with any predator that would come after his flock. So he would take that big blunt rod, and he would use it to bash in the skull, to, to, to push back any predator that was coming against his flock. And so that was the rod. And, and then he had a staff, long staff. And that staff was used to direct the sheep. So when that Lego piece, God sees that Lego piece, he's like, no, no, over here, Derek. And he takes it and he guides us a little bit and leads us even through the valley of the shadow of death. And the other thing I love about the staff is let's say we had like this rock ledge. We just happen to have a rock ledge literally here. But let's say if a sheep were to fall down in that lock, that, that, that cliff and couldn't get back up, what he would actually use that, sh- that staff with, he would actually use it to, to reach down to bring that sheep back into the flock. See, that, that's why it's so powerful what David says. He says, listen, it's your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Because in that moment, God is protecting him, even though he's disoriented, even though he doesn't know what's around him, God is protecting him. And he's also providing for him. This is the rod and the staff. Even in the midst of the darkness, God is with us and he's speaking to us. And it's in those moments that we need to hear his voice more than ever. The third piece and the final piece that I want you to write down today is that as we tell God the truth, as we ask him what is true, what he wants us to know, then I believe what the scripture calls us to is to give thanks for the light that we see. To give thanks for the light that we see. We see this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. You can look at this later. It's going to be on the screen here. The writer writes, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so some of us today, you're like, man, I don't know the will of my for God in my life. Some of you young people are like, man, I want to know God's will. Some of us old people are like, man, I still don't know God's will for my life. And I've been at this a long time. Uh, You want to hear God's will for your life? Here's one scriptural point. God's will for your life is for you to give thanks in all circumstances. That doesn't preach well sometimes, but it's truth. So what do we give thanks for? Do we give thanks for the evil that happens to us? Man, no, we we don't call evil good. Do we give thanks for things... Losing things and and having loss, no. But what we do is we give thanks for the light that is all around us. See, see, I love the analogy, what David uses in this section. He says that it is the valley of the shadow of death. And so I've got a a, a picture here that's going to hopefully help us, this visual here this morning, that will help us understand what what David is talking about a, a a little clearer. And so As we're talking about a shadow, I want you to know a few things. That the shadow David's talking about is those seasons in life where we feel like we have little hope. We don't really know which direction to go to. We feel like things are happening against us. And what I want you to know is that every shadow requires a source of light. If you're in a room that is all dark, those blinds are pulled. If you're in that room with the Legos over the floor, listen, if there's no light in there, there is no shadow in there. But once a light is actually introduced, it can actually produce a shadow. But every shadow you ever walk in, every dark season that you walk with, you gotta recognize that the reason why you know it's dark is because there is a light source. And the other thing we need to know this morning about the valley of the shadow of death is that every shadow is surrounded by light. That's in essence what a shadow is. That there is light all around that image that's being cast upon this screen. That there is light all the way around 
this shadow. And so what are we giving thanks for when I find myself in the valley of the shadow of death? I'm thanking God for his promise that he is with me, even in the darkness. I'm thanking God that his light is all around me, even though I'm standing in darkness. See, God is present in the dark. And what I love about what David writes, he says, uh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there's what we see is God's desire is to walk with us through the valley of death out of the shadow of death. See, God's desire is always to take us from darkness to light. This is why Jesus came to, to take that which was dark and bring it back into the light, to take us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. This is Jesus. His desire is not for you to stay in darkness and to stay in the valley of the shadow of death. This is not a destination. It's a part of the journey. See, Satan, he, he wants you to stay right here. He wants you to get so infatuated, so glued in on the darkness that we just stand here and circle and say, yep, I guess this is how it's going to be always. There's no hope. Our head goes down. We don't even see there's light all around us. We don't even see that God is with us, that he's speaking, and, and we just get in this circle of pattern. But God's saying, Derek, get your head up. I want to walk you through, not stay in the valley of the shadow of death. See, it's in these moments that God teaches us things that he couldn't teach us in the light. When he navigates us through the valley of the shadow of death, he actually gives us an opportunity to do something that we can't do in the light, to trust him when we don't see what he's doing. See, this is the whole essence of a shadow of death in a dark season. It's an opportunity for us to trust God, to worship God, to follow God, even when I can't see what's going on. In the midst of the shadow, I want you to see that God steps in even in the darkest moments. This is who God is. He is always with us even in the midst of our darkest moments. I've got one more psalm that I want to share with you. This is Psalm 139. I'm going to read it as we see this shadow here. This is what I'm talking about when we talk about when God never leads us. Listen to this. He says, where shall I go from your spirit? He's talking to, the, to God. Where shall I, shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. If I say, listen to this. Some of us are saying this this morning. Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. And here's the picture that I had even last night as I was preparing for this message. I was reading this passage, and even as I was doing that, I was thinking about this. This is how crazy my brain works, is I was thinking about Jesus, which is good because we're talking about him. But what I saw was Jesus with night vision goggles. Anybody else see that in their head when you read that verse? You know why? Because as Jesus walks through the darkness, he can see just like it's noonday. When he sees that Lego, he sees that we don't. He's like, hey, there's a Lego up here. Let me change direction a little bit. See, the night is like day to God. And so when he is leading us through the valley of the shadow of death, he is not wondering where we're going or why we're there. He is actually with us and he can see it all. And what he's asking us is to trust him, to follow him, to hear him, to obey him even when we don't know where we're at. See, this is Jesus. This is the picture of Jesus, that he stepped into the darkness of this world and the darkness could not, what? Overcome him, the light of the world. So here's the hope that all of us have. No matter what you're going through this morning, no matter what season of life you're going through, no matter what's the darkness, how dark it is, this is what you can know, that Jesus is present. He's aware and his light is all around you. Our hope is, to trust him even when we don't see it. I want to end with one last passage that Jesus speaks from. This is in Matthew chapter 11. This is in the message version translation. And this is what Jesus says. And I think it's a good question for all of us this morning. Jesus says, are you tired? Some of us are tired in this room. He says, are, are you worn out? Some of us are worn out in this room. He said, are you burnt out on religion? I think we can all say amen to that. He 
says, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Anybody else want to live freely and lightly? That's found and that's lived out in the company of Jesus. See, in the midst of our darkest days, in the midst of the time where we feel like, God, where are you? The truth that we stand on as followers of Jesus is that he said, I will never leave you or forsake you, ever. I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. And so what would it look like for you this week if you find yourself in a dark season or maybe in the future when you find yourself in a dark season, what would it look like for us to take away the sanitized prayers that we offer up to God, the fake us? And what if we offered up what is true, what we're really feeling? And then what if we had the humility to say, God, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to know about this situation? What, what do you want me to know in this moment where I feel like everybody's against me, where I feel like I'm passed over at work? where I'm feeling like I've got a huge void in my life. What do you want me to know? And then in that time, can we offer up a thanksgiving, even in the midst of the pain, even in the midst of darkness? This is God's desire for you. This is how we navigate the darkness. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for this truth, this incredible, unfathomable truth that you are with us, that, that darkness is not dark to you, that you are the light of the world. Wherever you go, you offer life and hope. And so, Lord, I pray that right now there'd be a breakthrough. Even as we sing this last song, that those of us that came in hopeless, that we would have a breakthrough of hope. Those of us that came in doubting and questioning, that you would send a surge of faith through our lives. Lord, I thank you personally that you've navigated me through many dark seasons, many seasons where I felt alone. And yet you were faithful. You're so faithful. So Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for always offering us to follow you into life, abundant life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand up and sing this last song together.
You are the 